all diets fail at six months because people cannot go forever being hungry. Nobody can. Read the starvation studies. People cannot deprive themselves of food for that amount of, uh, you know, for more than a few months, really. And so they start to regain weight. Well, hey, everyone. Dr. David Perlmutter here. Welcome again to our program, The Empowering Neurologist. One of my heroes in the world of nutrition is Nina Teicholz. We've had her on the program before. She wrote a, an amazing New York Times bestseller called The Big Fat Surprise and really did so much to open our eyes to the notion that we've been uh, led down the wrong path as it related to dietary fat. Now, of course, it's been a revolution uh, to write a previous revolution uh, that we are now re recognizing we need fat in our diet. As a matter of fact, fat is very, very good for us. Of course, the discussion would then center on what type of fat. But uh, Nina has really been extremely vocal in getting the message out that the incredible trend towards refined carbohydrates in the American, the, the Western, and now in the global diet has uh, is fraught with health consequences. And she's made it very clear she remains extremely vocal and is very active, as you will soon uh, learn. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Nina a little bit more. Nina Teicholz is a science journalist and an author, as I mentioned, of uh, The Big Fat Surprise, which upended the conventional wisdom on dietary fat, especially saturated fat and seed oils. She is the founder of the Nutrition Coalition, which is a nonprofit organization working to ensure that nutrition policy reflects the very best and the most current science. She's appeared on most major TV networks and her work has been published in places like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, as well as in academic journals, including the BMJ and the Journal of the National Academy of Sciences, one of the most well-respected uh, peer-reviewed uh, journals that we turn to. She's a graduate of Stanford and Oxford universities and is now the author of the Unsettled Science column hosted on Substack. So I'm really delighted to welcome Nina back to our program. Let's get started. Well, Nina, it's so great to see you. It, it took some doing to get this podcast together, didn't it? Yeah, just a bit on both our ends, yeah. I think, but good to see you. That's right. Uh, Mother Nature tried to conspire, but we prevailed. Um, in the intro, I described you as being a very important mentor for me uh, and applauded you for your outreach, for what you're doing. It's so necessary. And, you know, that'll be a theme throughout our time together today. I want to start out, you blogged about and shared your experiences and your thoughts on a Lancet paper from 2019 that really, I think the intent was to settle once and for all the question about what we should eat and really... I think came to conclusions that are not necessarily perhaps what you and I would think are totally validated as it relates to science. So how do we unpack what they put forth and then uh, what do we, what should we do in terms of messaging? So it's interesting that you bring up, this is a paper from 2019. Maybe we should let your listeners know uh, why that paper is still important. It was called the Eat Lancet Report and it really came out of an effort uh, that's been um, mainly in Europe, but it's backed by the um, World Economic Forum. And it's their proposal for what they call a universal reference diet, which is the diet for everybody on earth, um, and according to them. And it was put forward, they had a bunch of commissioners, I think 37 or 38. It's not too fresh in my mind right now, but uh, they um, and and I did an analysis of that commission panel. It was um, I would say seventy eight, seventy nine percent, or were people who had published and committed themselves to a um, plant based, entirely plant based, or mostly plant based diet, either for nutritional, but more often for um, environmental reasons. So, it, and the paper really was about trying to shift the diet to largely grain based. Okay. So I, if my memory serves correctly, it was 60 or 70% of the diet was grains. 
So it wasn't the bottom of the food pyramid. Yeah, essentially, that, as it, I mean, as it even existed. bigger bottom of the food. I mean, it was basically the food pyramid with a very fat bottom. Yeah. And so it wasn't even though it was sort of portrayed as fresh fruits and vegetables, there was hardly any fruits in there, not so many vegetables, more sort of legumes and grains. And I think what was really noticeable about it was that the amount of animal foods in the diet um, was so minuscule i think that the amount of red meat you were allowed was maybe like this much like half a gram a day or maybe a gram a day i mean it it and and similarly for eggs there was maybe a little more chicken allowed but that um report was motivated by the desire for climate change and what i think is the erroneous belief that we should as a first measure of course change our diets as a way of saving the planet because we can all agree we want to prevent climate change uh, from taking over and, and ruining our earth for all of us. But to, to, to balance carbon and methane on the backs of humans um, as a first measure is, I think, mistaken. I mean, you could do a lot by uh, reducing the contributions of oil and gas, of chemical plants, of you know most of the methane, which is pinned on cows, actually comes from natural gas um, exploitation. So we're consumers. I mean, the public is being told that we have to sacrifice, arguably, our health, our well-being. Right. Our and health. why you know, and I think, and in you know, we 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 doc part of my response was to document the huge number of multinational corporations behind this work. Um, just like every, in every name, you know, Unilever, Nestle, PepsiCo, um, many chemical companies, many of the companies that um, stand to profit if the blame for climate change is pinned on us consumers for the, for the meat that we are eating. Um, so I think it's a very unfortunate trend that we we have seen now going on for some years, uh, which is to sort of convince consumers that this is the one thing that they can do, um, because there's not an abundant amount of evidence, but there there is in the clinical trials and observational studies that we see, we see that when meat is removed from the diet, or 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 par the other side of that, which is when meat is added to the diet of, for say, starving children in, in Africa, tremendous gains are seen, right? Just giving them some whole complete proteins makes them uh, do much better at school, do better in the playground, show more leadership skills, just all of, you know, all around be much healthier just by small additions of meat to the diet, which are not equaled if you add the same amount of protein in dairy or some other form of calories. But the presentation was that 37 of the world's top nutritional scientists came together uh, and really formulated a, a broad scope uh, recommendation for planetary health and came up with this conclusion that uh, we need to eat more grain. Right. Did I say that? Uh, I'll say it again. We eat, need to eat more grain. Uh, as the bottom of our pyramid, uh, and you know, basically a plant-based diet because it's best for our health. Oh, and BTW, that's going to be the best thing for the planet as well. Everybody wins. We save the planet and, and we save our health. And I think that your contention is that on both counts, that recommendation is flawed. I mean, what you just said about meat, you know, the, the contra uh, to this is that, well, um, raising cattle for, for meat or other forms of meat uh, it has huge environmental consequences. Therefore, if we give it up, the planet will be saved. Not to, you know, not even to consider what's happening with uh, hydrocarbon burning and fracking and and the inefficiency of the of factories and automobiles, etc. Uh, having an you know logarithmic uh, increase impact in terms of the environment than the fact that there are uh, animal sources of protein available to humans, and it's it's. You know, we looked then at the USDA's recommendation, five-year recommendation. Similarly, I, I think you would agree was highly influenced by industry. Let's call it like it is in terms of the recommendation that having up to ten percent of your calories derived from sugar was okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think what you've been so masterful about over the years is letting people understand 
follow the money, that what's going on behind the scenes in terms of the recommendations from seemingly uh, beneficent organizations is really highly motivated by industry and not by science. And that's where, you know, you've stood up uh, head and shoulders above the crowd and said, hey, here's what's going on. And here's what the science really shows. Tell us about what, uh, the, what the science was, what the scientists were telling uh, the United States Department of Agriculture when it came time to formulate their five-year plan. Are you talking about the U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans? Uh, Correct. Okay, so that just so those were launched on uh, the American public in 1980. And just as a little scene setter, obesity in America at that point was 13, 12, 13, 14 um, percent of the total population for adults. Then we were told in starting in 1980 that food pyramid is no longer the food pyramid, but you know, that's the visual that I think most people understand that big bottom slab was originally six to 12 servings of grains per day. Um, and now it's down to six, but that six servings of grains per day still includes three servings of refined grains, right? So donuts is part of our advised diet and up to 10% of calories of sugar, as you said, this policy is supposedly updated every five years by bringing in a supposedly theoretically outside independent um, group of experts, and they are supposed to review the science from the past five years. Well, I have just done exhaustive reviews of these various, um, pro you know, these various iterations of the guidelines and discovered that, for instance, I mean, just extraordinary discoveries. I'll just share a few of them with you. One paper that we had come out last year in which I was an author uh, was that 95% of this outside expert committee called the Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee in 2000, for the 2015 guidelines, the one we're currently living with, 95% had a tie with a food or pharmaceutical corporation. More than half of that 20-person committee had more than 30 such ties one person had 151 ties. And, you know, these are, and there, was, there was a person there who had been the former director, uh, a former global director at Merck, a pharmaceutical company. Um, there had been the former president of the Dannon Institute, uh, which promotes mainly now low fat uh, yogurts. And so, I mean, these people have been deeply involved in industry, and yet they're the experts that are in charge. Um, so we also it, found, it, yeah. It, no, I'm just saying it's breathtaking. And I, I, we could stop there and just let that one hang over our heads a little bit. <laughs> True. That the people who are offering us up these doctrines uh, that influence what the military does, what school lunches provide, uh, are deeply tied, as you just described, to industry. And it's in their interest to fan the flames of the ratification of products that are not necessarily in our health interest. Yeah, it is. It's important to underscore for people who don't know and think this is just some abstract government policy, just how all important it is. It's required by law to be followed by all federal programs. So as you say, the military, all you know, VA hospitals, all food, uh, school lunches, feeding programs for the elderly, women and infant children, food baskets. They're taught in all medical schools to all healthcare practitioners who are considered the, <laughs> you know, the gold standard. And, you know, what is the result? The result is that if you go to and look at those food baskets for women and infant children, they literally have like kicks cereal, frosted mini wheat cereals, juices, they, they just are, I mean, we are, we are absolutely setting up our population for failed metabolic health. And, um, and so, you know, and, and, it, and clearly food institutions are deeply embedded in this process. I told you about this, this outside committee of experts inside the USDA, which is the main agency, federal agency that leads the guidelines. They have more than a hundred partnerships with these companies. So where they have these come, they're in partnership with them. So what does that, you know, what does that mean? PepsiCo has a whole healthy choice menu for kids where they're getting fed nachos, Doritos, Fritos, Tostados or Tostitos. I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's a real fusion of corporate interest and supposedly our public health um, institutions, you know, they're supposed to be acting in our public interest have clearly been captured by these um, extremely powerful corporate interests. 
you know, the, the main, I think the main threat of the recommended dietary approach was that it's extremely high in refined carbohydrates. Uh, when I say extremely high, I mean, for those of us in the field, we would all consider it to be extremely high. And there, there's been s such uh, an, uh, a large number of studies that have come out in the last couple of years where people are starting to become familiar with the term ultra processed, right. We're linking ultra processed foods to uh, Alzheimer's risk, dementia risk in general, uh, ovarian cancer, certainly uh, metabolic conditions, as if Alzheimer's were not, uh, but diabetes and obesity and dyslipidemia and hypertension, et cetera. And, and yet recently we've learned that 58% of the calories consumed by Americans come is derived from ultra processed foods that you would know uh, come in a package with an ingredient list and are most likely sweetened. So, uh, you know, and here we're getting government uh, influence telling us this is the, basically this is the way to go. It's good for industry. It's good for bottom line. The, uh, America's GDP continues to thrive and everybody's happy, but the downstream consequences for health and environmental impact, I think are profound at, at its core though, we, we come up against the notion of low carbs, high carbs, low fat, high fat. I mean, let's, Let's try to distill that as best we can, because I think a rallying point for you over years has been that the more good, let's make sure we get that across, good dietary fat in our uh, that we consume, the closer we get to a more ketogenic program and away from uh, a diet that's fundamentally based from a calorie perspective on carbohydrates seems to be better for us, though I recall... There was a recent uh, Lancet uh, study indicating that going on, going low carb is associated with a variety of health threats, including uh, all cause mortality. I think it was a Harvard study published in Lancet, and picked up by several of the news services. So, you've been, I think, very defensive, rightfully, uh, with respect to a more ketogenic diet, a more fat based diet with restriction of carbohydrates. So. Where do you, how do you get to that point? What, what caused you to, you know, initially uh, latch on to this notion that be, has become so trendy, uh, but what is it about this notion of less carbs and more fat that you found so attractive to write your book, for example, and, and all that you seem to be doing today? <laughs> so you know, I, when I started off this journey of trying to understand nutrition science now, some 20 years ago. I was a vegetarian and I was cooking my own bread and I was into the idea of healthy carbohydrates, whole grains. I mean, that was my diet. I avoided red meat. Then I spent almost a decade researching for my book, a book that I didn't, I, I started off writing a book about trans fats. And then part of the way through my editor said, you know, I think you're writing a book about saturated fats and the way that we had gotten the good fat, bad fat paradigm completely. That's a good editor right there. Head. Yes, she was. And she said, you're making an argument that we were wrong to shift away from natural whole fats, right? You know, butter and fats from animals and switch to industrial polyunsaturated seed oil. So actually my, my book came out, it was one of the first, I think it actually was the first calling attention to the problems with these industrial seed oils, especially when heated, all the inflammatory properties that come from that. And, and making the case that we had um, unfairly villainized uh, these natural whole animal fats and that they do not cause heart disease. That's the major thrust of the book. And then in researching that, I came across a guy named Gary Taubes, who is a journalist, and he was writing about the low carbohydrate diet. And and it's um, and so I wrote about kind of the beginnings of the, the low carbohydrate diet, and because it's part of the fat story. So I came in through this studying fats, but it's part of the fat story because once you villainize fats, what do you replace them with? You replace them with carbohydrates. So if you think about it in terms of what you put on your plate, if you're getting rid of meat, if you're getting rid of, you know, cheese pies or whatever, you, you replace that with most likely carbohydrates, right? You're going to replace it with pasta, some kind of grain based meal. If you replace bacon and eggs for breakfast, you're replacing it with cereals. So what and, and it immediately makes you wonder, well, we did that as a society. We increased our carbohydrate consumption between 1970 and, uh, and 2000 and, uh, 
15, I think, by some 25%. So we did as we were instructed. And what happened to health, right? So that's a correlation. It's not causation. But I started to chart the science. Starting in the early 2000s, there started to be experiments on subjects, human subjects from all walks of life with all types of diseases saying, what happens if we reduce those carbohydrates down to the level, the best estimate that we were eating in 1965 was 39% of calories, right? Now we're told to eat 55% of calories as, as carbohydrates. So what happens when you reduce those carbohydrates and the experiments were extraordinary, right? There were people were um, always losing more on low carb compared to low fat in, in every trial that you could find. They could normalize their blood pressure within a matter of weeks. They were starting to reverse all the symptoms of diabetes. And now we know there are trials that actually reverse the a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Um, and so I've been following that scientific literature now for 20 years. There's more than a thousand papers on just the clinical trial literature, which is the most rigorous kind of science that you can do. There's just, there's more than a dozen two year long clinical trials. Again, rigorous science. There's a five year long clinical trial. I mean, one of the things that I've done over the course of researching endlessly nutrition and health is looked at how many, how many studies can I, clinical trials, can I pull up for other diets, right? That give the same, and, and the quantity of literature behind, let's just say US News and World Report, their top 10 diets, most of them don't even have a single clinical trial behind them. So you have, I mean, I became convinced because the clinical trial research is enormous. So there's now just a large body of science behind low carbohydrate diets. Um, so for people who don't know the difference, their low carbohydrate is, I mean, ketogenic diet is sort of a more extreme version of usually under 20 grams right. of carbohydrates a day. But we wrote a paper about how that summarized all the literature and, and argued that this really should be one viable option in our government's nutrition policy, particularly for people who are suffering from these con diseases, you know, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, heart disease. So, you know, I just became convinced by the science. Um, it took me, you know, a while to change my own diet. That's a whole separate story. I wasn't, I, it took me some time, but the science really convinced me. So, you know, arguments against keto are you're going to be tired, you're going to break out with acne, you're going to uh, experience fatigue, you're going to increase your cholesterol, you're going to increase your heart attack risk. Let's 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 do the cardiac thing first. What is yeah. the evidence that going on a ketogenic diet is going to be bad for your heart? Um, so the the main piece of evidence is this um the sign that your ldl your so-called bad cholesterol will increase for some people on a ketogenic diet often that is some accompanied by their increase in saturated fat consumption some people um, what they have found now in the five-year findings that were presented last year at the american diabetes association that was so-called verta trial that um, was headquartered at the university of indiana involving hundreds of patients, at five years, they found that that rise in LDL cholesterol was transient. In other words, it was re it resolved and went back down to normal. Um, and at the same time, all inflammatory markers, I think they measured some kind of like at least 28, 29 other markers for cardiovascular risk, all of them improved. So what you have is, I mean, there's a lot of focus on LDL because we have I think drugs to treat it, but you know, if you have 29 other cardiovascular risk factors going in a different direction, uh, you have to assume that that diet is not worsening your cardiovascular risk. And there was, there's also a study, um, there's a smaller trial that uh, by Dr. Tro and his group that did an employer-based program where they found that um, cardiovascular risk score, as calculated by the American Heart Association, um, they in, they increase life by. I think it was 13 years um, by putting people on a, a low carb or ketogenic diet. So there's quite a lot of data out there now to show that nearly all cardiovascular risk factors improve from this diet and that the LDL cholesterol rise, which worries people so much, is transient.
Mm. And I would say that you know, there was a JAMA article, I think, dating back 18 years called the A to Z trial. And, yeah. you know, it found what we called at that time the Atkins diet because Dr. Robert Atkins was his way out guy telling us we should eat more fat and cut the carbs. Yeah, right. Cra crazy idea. And, uh, you know, across all the parameters, including C-reactive protein, his uh, diet seemed to be the best. Uh, despite the popularity of all the other uh, uh, diets, you mentioned keto for um, for diabetes, and I would just want our list, our viewers, to consider watching the interview I did with Dr. Sarah Hallberg, discussing the actual reversal of type two diabetes uh, going on. I mean, dramatic uh, uh, findings in terms of that Verta Health uh, uh, program that you just described, and you know, it, it brings to mind the notion of treatment for diabetes. Mainstream medicine does not have any treatment, none whatsoever for diabetes. In fact, I asked an audience of mainstream doctors this uh, several years ago in New Jersey, what's your go-to treatment for diabetes? And hands went up and there were you know, various drugs that were talked about, well, metformin or you know, various uh, other types of drugs. And I said, well, the, the tr fact of the matter is that those drugs are not treating the diabetes. They're lowering the blood sugar, but stop the drug and two days later, what happens? You know, it's not, tr it's treating the smoke and not the fire. I've said that, my, my viewers are probably tired of hearing that. But what you're doing with a ketogenic diet is you're correcting the underlying metabolic di dysfunction. In this case, as it relates to diabetes, the insulin sensitivity mm -hmm. is restored, allowing your body to handle it on its own. I got this, I don't need drugs anymore. And it it's so sad uh, that, you know, mainstream medicine is watching TV at night and people are thrilled because they got their A1C below seven as if that's some kind of accomplishment because they're taking injections or they're taking pills. And by and large, I think to appeal to a broader audience, many of the people in these advertisements are perhaps a little overweight uh, so that people can feel they're not stigmatized, they're part of a club. And it's all related. All these metabolic issues are strongly related, though I think mainstream wants us to compartmentalize uh, these issues. Diabetes has nothing to do with hypertension. Well, as a matter of fact, it does. Uh, and dyslipidemia, they're all functioning in the same way as a response to these dietary uh, missteps that we have been convinced to take. And again, you know, that that's sort of right out of your playbook. It's what you've talked about for so long. You have, uh, you had a, a famous now on the internet, uh, debate, you're going to love this, <laughs> with Dr. David Katz. So uh, do the setup for that debate uh, for us. Let us know who he is and how that played out, because it's, I believe, one of your shining moments. Oh, that's very nice of you. I mean, Dr. David Katz, uh, so even before my book was published, Dr. David Katz, who at the time led a center associated with Yale University, uh, he wrote an attack column on my book even before it had been published in uh, in the Huffington Post. And then he proceeded to write a series of attack columns um, aimed at me. And he used to call me, uh, you know, he called me a, a wing nut and I must be hiding in my mother's basement. And, and you know, he, he was, and I'm a, it's, it's been a while now since I've thought about this, but, you know, an enemy of science and, yeah, that's professional. It's really, you know, really professional. So it turns out when I looked into this, who knew Dr. David Katz, he was, uh, he, you know, had received hundreds of thousands of dollars from, from, I think it was Nestle, Quaker Oats. I mean, he had been funded by every junk food company you can possibly imagine. Actually, there was a, there's a, a pretty good blog on him called Junk Food Slyest Defender um, that was put up on CrossFit on uh, some years ago, but he, you know, he had all these, these junk food companies at his back and he was the person that had been unleashed to attack me. And he did this over the course of years. Eventually I had to hire a lawyer or, or oh my to do something. I mean, I've done this numerous times now in my career, but to get him to stop smearing me because, uh, you know, it was, it was libelous. And then he started to call, me, you know, the butter, meat and cheese people of the world. And that became sort of my pseudonym. 
Anyway, at some point, uh, the person who runs something called Soho uh, Debates in New York City decided to put on a debate between us, and we went back and forth and agreed to a set of terms over many, many months, right? What was going to be the question and what he was going to debate, debate versus me. And, um, you know, I'm not an expert or skilled debater, so I, I, you know, I didn't, I think that I did all right in this debate, but he had clearly been extremely well prepared. And what he did was, it was a very clever, he ran out the clock. So just talking about this or that. And then in like the last five minutes, he clicked through about 75 studies. Then you couldn't see the headlines, you couldn't see the authors, you know, but, you know, but this was all supposed evidence for his point of view, which was, you know, his point of view, I should have said at this out, outset, was we should be having, you know, mostly vegan diet, right? He's he's with the Eat Lancet folks, eat mostly, eat mostly plants and very few animal foods. So this was like, you know, his evidence was like as if you took a 200 pound, a 200 page thesis and just dumped it at the feet of your advisor and it hadn't been stapled. So all the sheets go everywhere and say, oh, this is my argument. What a metaphor. Jeez. And, you know, and you're like, well, maybe it's a good argument, but I wasn't able to see a single thing. You know, I can't, there's no, I can't read this or understand it. Um, so, you know, I struggled to respond to that, but, uh, which was kind of a very disingenuous approach. And he was being coached on the stage because I could see the the text messages going furiously back. Oh my gosh. And he also stacked the audience, which we knew because, you know, you vote before and after whether or not you've been convinced by somebody. And, uh, and we could see all his fans cheering him and meeting him afterwards, but I'm not complaining. I mean, it was good to meet him in person after so long. And, uh, and I don't think it did him any favors ultimately, because what I was able to do in my presentation was to list his many, many conflicts of interest now enshrined on the internet. And I was able to list his many disparaging, completely unprofessional comments about me. And not too long after that, actually, he lost his position at Yale. Uh, and so he was, well, he, he was uh, ag aggressive with, uh, in a very derogatory way with respect to grain brain and, uh, um, and over the years has been has been pretty aggressive, though I, I think his position may have tempered as of late. But um, I remember I was going to be on uh, CBS this morning and I, I got a heads up that they were not going to be embracing me <laughs> on this morning show I, the night before I'm at dinner. Uh, so I wasn't back on my heels and everything started off real lovey dovey, friendly. Welcome to the program. Uh, Dr. Perlman, this is when I revised Grain Brain five years later. Um, in your revision of Grain Brain, you're again calling for us to reduce our, our uh, processed carbohydrates and sugar. And then the individual talked about how she had a cupcake for breakfast or whatever it was, and Dr. Perlmutter. They, and then they quoted uh, a quote from David Katz. But even then, we reached out, the transparency. We reached out to the sugar industry this is on live national television. And they told us, they put up a picture of a chocolate chip cookie. They told us that sugar in, moder in moderation is no threat to our health. And how do you respond? And I said, you know, it's like when the tobacco companies used to tell us that smoking was good for our health. Just a little bit. And right. Just a bit. And I have that, I play that clip actually quite often in, uh, when I lecture because you know, they call, they made it very easy for me. I mean, they showed us what's motivating. Let's face it, television and what is vetted on television and news is really, uh, again, focused toward the bottom line. And that would be their advertisers who would, you know, be very upset should there be somebody on the program that talks about why we should limit our consumption of the very products that are supportive of this of this network. So it's it's uh, it's never easy. Let me go back to a couple other questions of keto because I know many of our viewers uh, are are deep into keto. Um, how is keto for weight loss, for example? Well, that's a very interesting question uh, because the clinical trial literature. Uh, let me just cut this a few different ways. The there, if you stack up low carb versus low fat experiments, experiments that pitted those two diets against each other, people always lose more weight on low carb, always. Uh, and that's a consistent finding. However, 
how much more weight do they lose? Well, when they, the, the, the one study I know of that tried to quantify that came up with a pretty small finding that it was only a couple of pounds difference. I don't know if what was what they did with their study selection or how they came up with such a small uh, number. So the clinical trial literature doesn't support that diet as being vastly superior than low fat. However, I think the, um, the clinical experience that doctors have with this diet is that people who are able to sustain it, right? It has to be sustainable. It's not something you do for a little while and then go back on. People who can sustain it, and typically that means sustainability involves joining a community, having support, um, especially for a diet that's so unpopular and unpopular with your friends, family, and doctor, you need support. Those people really do lose truly significant amounts of weight, amounts of weight that are considered impossible currently in the obesity, the expert obesity community. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking, I mean, Dr. Tro, a doctor I mentioned before, was a, who's a large practice now outside of New York City. I mean, he's, he's, he says his 100 pounds plus club, people who've lost more than 100 pounds, is now over 1,000 people. So, this is not captured in the clinical trial literature, but I think uh, it is what physicians who are skilled at guiding people through this diet with health coaches and the like are finding in their patients. Um, and, you know, why does it work better? Uh, it works better because I would say the top reason is that it is um, satiating. People are not hungry on that diet. All diets fail at six months because people cannot go forever being hungry. Nobody can. Read the starvation studies. People cannot deprive themselves of food for that amount of, uh, you know, for more than a few months, really. And so they start to regain weight. But a ketogenic diet, which provides protein and especially fat, those are satiating. And you can sustain it because those foods are, are definitely satiating. Now, I mean, we could get into the, also the, the topic of how hard it is to quit sugar addiction, carb addiction. Those are also issues. I mean, there, there are big issues around changing diet. It is not easy. But, um, but what I would say about the ketogenic or low-carb diet is that it's the best possible solution we have come across that, uh, for a nutritional approach. I'm not talking about drugs. <laughs> um, I'm just saying in terms of what you can do with your diet, a ketogenic diet is by far the most promising approach. So, and I, maybe I should just address, can I address the mortality issue a little bit? You may, absolutely, okay. yes. So that's actually, a, uh, you know, this idea that despite your losing weight, improving cardiovascular risk factors, reversing your diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, that you would, you would shorten your life in the long term. Even though, you know, what do people die of in America? They die of those diseases. So it does, it seems counterintuitive that if you reverse all those diseases, you would then have a shorter life. However, these, there's a number of observational studies that had that finding. And I will just say, I, you know, I reviewed them all for this paper that I um, mentioned earlier on a review of low carbohydrate literature. They all define the low carbohydrate diet inaccurately. So they just define it as 40% of calories as being low carbohydrate, which is inaccurate. It has to be, if you're talking percentages, it has to be 25% or fewer calories to actually have the kind of impact that you'd like to see. And further, those observational studies all, you know, capture populations really before the low carb diet even became something that we can measure. I mean, we don't have significant populations following that diet until maybe 15 years ago, even with Dr. Atkins, I don't think it was a significant, such a significant portion of the population. So they're really not capturing accurate data there. Um, and, and they're not referring to a low carbohydrate diet. Uh, and, and I think like we can't have this conversation without recognizing again, like what are the larger corporate act and political actors in which we're having this conversation, which is there is, there is so much advertising, media, pharmaceutical advertising, big food company advertising, as you said, on television, everywhere that is pushing these ideas that this this diet is dangerous. Why? Because they sell those, they sell the high grain sugary products. They want to keep people with their double stuff Oreos eating, you know, those, the, those foods. They want to tell them the little bit is okay. Um, just everything in moderation. And then on the back end, the pharmaceutical companies, they they make their money by selling you those, you know, pills for each and every one of your conditions, 
or devices. And now or, Ozempic or now Ozempic uh, for diabetes to help you lose weight. Projected to be the, uh, you know, a, maybe the biggest block, blockbuster drug of all time. So, you know, one can't be really too cynical about what their motivations are. And um, so we're in this, that is our climate of, of having these conversations. I mean, if you don't think that they they are able to get their stories in the media and able to, I mean, just look at the rollout of Ozempic. It's, you know, on 60 Minutes, right. there's a thousand articles all over the media that comes from the, the power of pharmaceutical money driving that through the media. So, That's right. Because it's not necessarily approved for that, but yet through the uh, media, i.e. their entree into 60 Minutes, you're correct. Um, you said something, and I just want to reiterate, you said you can't be too cynical as it relates to this, meaning it, it's beyond what we can even get our arms around in terms of how deep it goes. Um, the White House Conference on Hunger, Health and Nutrition was uh, purported to be this very large coming together of, you know, from various sectors to come up with a plan it hadn't happened since the Nixon era. What was your takeaway from, you know, what transpired and how that has influenced uh, policy moving forward? Uh, yeah, that was a conference last September. It was shrouded in mystery is the main headline, I would say. It was, uh, you know, there there's still no um, agenda, no detailed agenda. There was no bios on any of the speakers. There's, there's no summary of the conference that, you know, is publicly available. It was nobody knew who was invited or, or what was happening there. Um, it was a very mysterious conference. It was driven by... Um, Tufts University uh, was very close to the USDA, has a USDA center uh, at, at Tufts, and they had done the, the major task force work that um, that led up to the conference. And the dean of the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, somebody named Dari Mozafarian, had been the top uh, advisor to that conference. And... Um, and so it really is unclear what came out of it, except for there. Well, it's not entirely unclear. There were a number of proposals to basically expand our dietary guidelines to more people, more places, more nutrition education. I should say, you know, in this conference's favor, it focused on nutrition as an important part of resolving diet related diseases, which is something we should we all agree upon. I mean, that is absolutely most certainly true. And that had not been a conversation that people in um, in nutrition and health had really had, remarkably. Connecting, oddly enough, just connecting, connecting nutrition to health. You know, I, I mean, like you to know, say, aside from, yeah, go ahead. The way, Tim Ryan, you know, and uh, being shot down years ago by George McGovern, but what a notion, what a notion that the, the foods you eat have a role to play in your health. Quick story, our dog was losing his fur. We took him to, I went with my wife, take him to the vet. And um, the, the vet walks in and asks my mother, what are you feeding Tico? And my wife responded. And I looked at the vet and thought, how does she come out and ask this question? What if I, seeing patients, ask them what they're eating, which I do, of course, mm -hmm. but what a crazy question. First thing you ask is, what are you feeding your dog? And that's what you'd expect at the vet. Of course it is. What's the food? But not in humans. You know, what drugs are you taking and what more do you need? Yeah. And, and you know, and the issue there is just that I think doctors really have, you know, a uh, learned helplessness. It's not that they're not interested in nutrition, but they've been told and they prescribe a diet that is designed, has been shown to fail. I mean, so of course they don't believe in diet, even though they feel they should advise it. But you're right. We don't talk about the diet part of diet related diseases. So this conference <laughs> uh, actually did put the spotlight on that important component. Unfortunately, the answer was uh, the answer was let's do more of what we've been doing in the dietary guide. Let's push out the dietary guidelines even more, even though, again, that's the, you know, six servings of grains a day, 10% of sugar has been demonstrated to produce obesity and diabetes in America. And, you know, we don't need, what we need is a, a dietary guidelines that actually functions well. Instead, they're pushing out this policy that has been demonstrated to fail. So that was part of it was, let's have more government and more in, in our nutrition. 
And another part of it. That's a good plan. Yeah, because the definition of sanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. <laughs> right. And the definition of status quo, according to Ronald Reagan, is the mess we're in. <laughs> right. So, and then the other part of, uh, which was very mysterious, but there were, there was a, I think maybe $8 billion invested uh, in a pledged investments. And when I went into this nutrition sector and when, but there was no list really of what they were. And when I started to look into just some of them there, they were almost entirely fake food companies. So, you know, we're developing fake cheese, fake seafood, fake this, fake that. And that is clearly another corporate play, which is, delivering to people to try to replace natural foods with these highly patent protected industrial foods that are, you know, have much higher profit margins for, um, for, the, for all the investors. So that's really another kind of investor corporate play. And in fact, one of the major, the major drivers of this conference was a, a group of investors who, you know, it's arguably they're just, they're, they're seeking to create new markets for their investments. Yeah. So I have two friends who attended, who were invited, and I've asked them what went on. And there's, I don't think they're hiding anything, but I don't think they, I don't think they know what went, went on. I don't think they walked away. You know, you go to a conference, say, this is the goals, this is what we accomplished. And I haven't heard. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Uh, I will say, interestingly, uh, several of American physicians, including myself, were invited to speak to the then Prince, now King Charles, uh, several months ago, who wanted to address this exact issue. How can we interface, meaning England, how can we interface with industry uh, with the principles that we are espousing to bring about better uh, health uh, as it relates to England? Uh, it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting discussion. And, you know, he's, you know, become king, so he's been a bit sidetracked, but I think we're going to pick it up again at some point in the future. And maybe England will lead the way and demonstrate lowered healthcare costs, lowered healthcare uh, expenditures as it relates to the diseases that are related to food, which is basically every chronic degenerative condition uh, that you can think of. You know, ultimately based on dysregulated metabolism. Well, listen, I'm looking at uh, unsettled science. What is that? That's uh, in my new column that's hosted by Substack. And I'm writing whenever I have a chance to. Uh, I know that feeling. Yeah. When just when uh, I mean I covered the White House conference. I've I've done some other pieces. I hope I hope to do more. Right? But I I think they're really when I look out on the landscape of nutrition journalism, what I see is almost no critical reporting at all. Uh, I see um, nobody's following the money. It's an interesting thing about why we know so little about this field where you're talking about, let's say a $10 trillion market for food and pharma. Well, some people know uh, how to follow the money on pharma, but you know, on food, the nutrition writers tend to come out of the lifestyle sections. They tend to be cookbook writers. I mean, they're not journalists really looking at an, a, a massive industry. And so there just aren't stories on, there aren't investigative stories in the field of nutrition. Um, people think it's something. Well, I think both you and uh, Gary Taubes have done an exceptional job. And, you know, you're both at, at your heart, uh, a science writers. And by definition, you're looking at facts. So, uh, you know, the two of you have really, uh, really educated all of us, you know, the people who are in positions of implementing. And it's been ex extremely helpful. So, again, unsettled science. Where do we find unsettled science? You can just look not metaphorically. I mean, where do we find your <laughs> you can column? find it everywhere, David? <laughs> That's uh, <true>. yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe you can just put it in the show notes. But if you if you okay. look up unsettled science and some part of my name, I'm sure you can. Okay, we will do that. that. Would be great. I love spending time with you. I applaud you. Thank I'm you. grateful that you're here doing the work that you're doing, and I. I look forward in a couple of years or maybe sooner, we'll get together again and see what you're up to at that point. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you, David. It's really a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm grateful for what you're doing out there too. You bet. Right. Bye for now. Take care. So how cool is Nina? I mean, she is out there fighting the fight. She has a deep belief that our lack of dietary fat and our dependence upon dietary refined carbohydrates 
uh, both are conspiring to bring about ill health. And I think the science is absolutely supportive of what she uh, is telling us. Uh, it's great that there are people out there getting this message out. Her message has certainly gained an incredible amount of traction. And she has served for all of us uh, as a mentor in many, many ways. And I absolutely applaud the work that she's doing. So again, her book, The Big Fat Surprise, uh, is still very, very valuable. I would certainly uh, take a look at that and follow her uh, on social media and on her uh, platform as well. Thank you, Nina, for joining us. And thank you to all of you who've joined us today as well. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and I'll be back soon. Bye for now. Music.